welcome to our second plenary at Engage. It's such a delight to have you all here with us. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Stephen Hill and um, welcome Stephen. Stephen has been a friend of the NCCPE since our inception and he's Research Director at Research England. Stephen. Thanks very much, Sophie, and good morning, everyone. It's great to, uh, to be here today for this uh, plenary session on funding for change. Um, I guess it goes without saying that we're meeting today and this week at a time of huge challenges. Uh, we have, of course, the pandemic and its associated uh, economic fallout, but we mustn't forget that we were already facing, before the pandemic arrived, the ever-pressing climate emergency and the uh, and the, the need for urgent responses to that. Um, and I'm sure you all agree that to rise to these challenges and build a better, more inclusive, more resilient society, we're going to need universities and researchers to work ever closer and in more integrated ways with civil society and the communities that make up civil society. So this morning, we've got the privilege to hear from two of the leaders uh, of organizations that are committed to investing in research on the one hand and in communities on the other. And we have the opportunity to explore with them how we can build the better and stronger links between communities and researchers that we undoubtedly need. So the way the session is going to uh, run today, I'm going to introduce our two speakers in a moment. Uh, they have, uh, are going to speak for around 10 minutes each um, and then we'll open uh, the floor to Q&A, as Sophie's already introduced, uh, and uh, that will allow us to, uh, to hear from, what, from our speakers, but also to really probe and interrogate uh, the, uh, the issues that they're going to raise. So our speakers today are uh, Ottilin Leiser and Dawn Austwick. Uh, Ottilin is the Chief Executive Officer of UK Research and Innovation, uh, the UK's primary public research funder, uh, and prior to joining UKRI earlier this year, uh, she was Professor of Plant Development at the University of Cambridge and Director of the Sainsbury Laboratory there. Um, I've known Ottilin for, uh, for many years, more years than we probably uh, care, to, care to count, because um, uh, we're both, both plant sciences, scientists. But I think it's worth saying that in her research career, uh, working with a, a whole uh, array of co-workers, uh, she's made outstanding contributions to plant growth and development, and I'm looking forward to her uh, making equally outstanding contributions as CEO of uh, UK Research Innovation. And our second speaker is Dawn Ostwick, who is the CEO of the National Lottery Community Fund, uh, uh, also a major funder in the UK context. Uh, prior to joining the fund, Dawn was uh, deputy chief, uh, was chief executive, sorry, at the Esme Fairbairn Foundation, and was previously deputy director of the British Museum uh, and project director for Tate Modern. Um, so I think you'll agree we've got uh, two fantastic speakers to hear from this morning. So I'll shut up now uh, and hand over to Ottilin uh, for her 10 minutes opening comments. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I have some slides which I will try to rump through within my 10 minutes. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the introduction and I'm really um, delighted to be here public engagement is something I'm super passionate about and actually think that we kind of need to reframe in a way that um, I hope I will manage to uh, express in the, this um, rapid slide presentation. Um, because one of the things I think is really extraordinary is the way we have somehow or other organized it so that there is a thing called science or research or whatever, and there's a thing called public and that those two things are separate and one has to engage the two. And ideally, I, I would like um, the whole concept of research and innovation to be so deeply embedded in the way we think about society that the, this, that the idea of two communities engaging kind of goes away. And, and the reason I think that, that this is a doable thing is because actually research, science and innovation, all of those things, they are child's play, or at least child's play is research and innovation. You watch your kind of two-year-old exploring the world and you can see that it's deeply part of who humans are. What's this? How does this work? How can I work, make this work for me? How can I solve this problem? Um, it are absolutely fundamental questions and, and that people ask all the time. And science and research are really a, just a formalized set of tools for allowing us to work through those questions in a way that um, allows us to build uh, year on year in how we understand the world and how we can interact with it um, well and how we understand each other indeed. 
So it's absolutely um, core to being human. And yet somehow we've managed to build this divide. And I could spend a very long time talking about what maintains this divide, but I think it's uh, really crucial that we should dismantle it because in the current situation, that divide has all kinds of very negative consequences. It narrows the range of people um, coming into the, the kind of heart of the research and innovation system. It makes it much harder to connect that system deeply to societal needs, which I think is crucial for, for the, the kind of bond that we need between that system and, and society at large. And um, I think it crucially deprives people of agency by setting research up as a sort of specialist thing that other people do. It uh, makes less accessible to people those tools, those basic tools for how you navigate the world and its many uncertainties um, uh, because it, it, it devolves them to experts when everybody has that power and potential because it is such a, a basic human skill. Um, and I, I like this quote from the, the nurse review that led to the establishment of UKRI. Uh, in, uh, uh, he wrote back in 2015 that what we need is a, a compact that bonds science and society and then delivers both excellent science and ensures that it's uh, um, uh, put to the uh, public use, used in the pub for the public good. And um, that I think uh, has got to be core of, of how UKRI works. Um, we are the largest funder of research and innovation in the UK um, as a result of the Nurture Review, bringing together um, nine councils covering all the disciplines and also all the sectors where um, research and innovation are carried out. And um, as a public body, we're obviously accountable to government and we work then really closely with a whole range of partners and are therefore in a really great position to steward a kind of research and innovation system that achieves those kinds of uh, uh, ideals that I've been advocating. And one of those has got to be to try and take down this wall, which is, as I say, built for very many reasons, I think. And part of it comes to shifting the whole concept of what the research and innovation system is and how it should work. At the moment, I think we're very focused on the notion that there are discoveries that are, you know, done by brilliant scientists and they're very tricky and we have some process that translates those um, through innovation into products that are, are going to um, do good things in the world and we tend to think about how we invest money and how we support the system through investing in discoveries and investing in products and I think we focus far too little on the people that are involved in, in delivering this whole process. And those people are not just the researchers and innovators, they are a huge connected network of people contributing in many, many different ways to make the system work. They're not these lone scientists or researchers, they are um, many, many different um, types of people. And uh, that would include, I should go back to this slide, all of you people out there who are playing a key role in, in, uh, in uh, connecting the things going on in laboratories and libraries and whatever around the country to the wider world. And I think um, highlighting the, the many different roles in the research and innovation system that make it work, thinking harder about how we support those roles and value those roles is absolutely crucial in, in building this truly connected system that um, can take down the wall between science and the rest of society and also that can um, bring far more people into the system because they can see in the system that the job that's for them there isn't just one job in research and innovation there are hundreds and many many people can contribute and uh, uh, to the its essential and effective functioning and so that's what um, uh, UKRI is trying to do we are um, as uh, major investors in 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 research and innovation. And uh, we have, I think, the opportunity to think about the whole system and to support that whole system in the context of who's in it, um, how they're supported, what they do, and crucially, um, front and center, why they're doing it. Um, so we want this outstanding research and innovation system that crucially gives everyone the opportunity to contribute and to benefit. And through that, um, we, uh, that's really the only way, I think, to ensure that we embed the whole concept more broadly so that we can enrich everyone's lives locally, nationally and internationally. And um, uh, our mission then is to uh, 
use multiple tools, convene and catalyze and invest in close collaboration with all those partners um, to build that inclusive research and innovation system that connects discovery to prosperity and public good through that complex network of people. I think that's crucial. And I, one of the extraordinary things that, that the pandemic has done is make much more visible all of this in action. We can, we can see science working in real time as Patrick Valance stands up every week and tells us um, what's happening. We can see the evidence growing. We can see as a result, the interpretation changing. And we can see that the evidence and the data are not enough. We have to use all kinds of other tools to understand and interpret those and to weave together um, uh, different types of evidence to build the best possible response um, in real time. And we can see very clearly that science is helping tremendously to navigate uncertainty and to mitigate it, but it does not eliminate it. And I think that's crucial. And different types of evidence from different fields need to be woven together. It's not just a medical issue. And <clears throat> I, I think that um, we have also discovered, in my view, that the quality of public discourse around all of this is not good enough and that everybody here, particularly this um, on this call, is really key in driving up that quality and building the well-funded, connected, embedded system that we need to allow us to tackle really well these really difficult challenges we're facing, um, including um, climate change, as Stephen mentioned just now. So I'm really... Um, excited about the opportunities emerging from these crises to consider the research and innovation system in this much more connected, embedded way uh, with people um, much more front and centre and diverse people doing different things to build that high quality system that we need. And um, I think the kinds of initiatives we're talking about today are absolutely beautiful examples of a key element in the system that we need to think about more and put more front and center so that we can create the connections and and um, collective endeavor, collective responsibility that we need to tackle the problems of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ottoline. Uh, Thought provoking comments, which I'm sure will generate lots of questions. Um, so, um, can I now ask Dawn to uh, make her opening comments? Very much, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. I always find it very strange doing these Zoom conversations because when you're in a room, you can read the room. And when you're on a screen, you have no idea what's going on out there. But I'm going to assume that you're all engaged and interested. I, I am delighted to be here and really refreshed by what Ottoline has said, actually. I'm going to talk a little bit from, um, from the perspective of communities. I run the National Lottery Community Fund and um, we, we're the largest distributor of community funding in the UK. Uh, all our money comes from people who buy national lottery tickets and that's a very good um, uh, string to keep us attuned to what communities want to need, all communities. Um, and our funding is generally highly responsive. So we're interested in what matters to communities. We're not so interested in what's the matter with them. That's a key part of our philosophy. What matters to them? What do they want to do? And how do they want to build? Our funding is um, a mixture of thematic and then highly responsive and open. Uh, and what's important about that is in, in, every, in, in any kind of five year period, our money will be going to 90% plus of every ward in the country. So it does really get down to a very granular level. And I think one of the things that's very interesting about the community sector is it is stuffed full of a sort of hidden sector, unassociated groups, unincorporated organizations who are working at a very, very grassroots level. And it's been really interesting, and I'll come back to this in a moment, um, how much that pattern of life and activity has come to the fore in helping communities weather the storm of COVID over the last nine months. Um, I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna talk about place, uh, I'm gonna talk about inclusion, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about COVID. So I said that our, our money gets into all those bits that those of you who are old enough can remember um, other beer can't get to. Uh, and, and the reason for that um, is because we have worked very, very hard to understand our relationship to place and context uh, and to be able to make our decisions in a context driven way. 
Uh, and over the last five years, we have deliberately moved our staff from central offices, often screen based, to being um, community based and community led. So all, all our funding officers will have a patch that they're responsible for and they need to get to know it and they're in the field. Why, why did we think that's important? Because in order to understand a place, I think we've concluded that you have to be there in some shape or form. Why? Because I think there's been a massive loss of trust in institutions from a distance that aren't local, um, that local uh, communities have had a lot done to them, um, but not so much either done with them or done by them for themselves. Uh, and that actually to be able to make really informed decisions, you need to have the networks and the relationships uh, and the knowledge that goes with having that kind of local presence. And I appreciate in, in research funding, that can be quite an, a research activity. That's quite a challenge for you guys. I, I can see that because of where research funding tends to go and where a lot of institutions are based. So what one to ponder on. Um, we, we, got to that, we, we got to where we are through quite a hard road. Um, I'll just share one example. We ran a series of very large strategic programmes um, in our England portfolio, each taking a knotty societal problem, um, whether it's about improving the life chances of those born to the greatest disadvantage or addressing loneliness in, in old age. Um, and all of those five programmes were based on a series of local partnerships across 58 different places in, in England. They were all multi-year, hundreds of millions of pounds, all brought together agencies from lots of different, different um, parts of the public sector, civil society, and sometimes the private sector. And there's a really interesting question for us about um, what succeeded. They definitely made a difference, but they didn't, I think, and haven't necessarily had the impact that we would have wished in building local partnerships. Now, why is that? I think they were possibly on the one hand over-designed and on the other hand, they assumed that partnerships between agencies in locations would automatically add value through collaboration. Uh, but the driver of how often organisations operate and how money flows actually encourages a focus that goes up the chain rather than out and across into the community and the place. So we thought about how do we have different models and, and built into all those models now, we're much, much more insistent on looking at what is your model for working within a community. Uh, and there's different methodologies. There's ABCD, there's collective impact, there's community organization that folk like Citizens UK do. But we really want to see what is that methodology and is it at the heart of what you're actually doing? Um, I also think that those models were a little bit 20th century. I think a lot of what we what we've been doing and COVID has shown a lot, thrown a bit of a light on this is a little bit 20th century, a little bit technocratic in its way of thinking, but actually it's not necessarily fit for purpose of a digital world where we can be more agile, we can be more relational whilst also operating at scale, uh, we can build cohesion more effectively, and we can insist on community voice being at the heart of decision making. I came across a really interesting COVID example, actually. Um, I happened to be on the um, advisory board of the Institute of Policy Research at Bath Uni, and um, they had been working through COVID with the local council and um, the local voluntary sector on something, the Bath and North East Somerset Compassionate Community Hub, which um, I subsequently found out actually we'd also funded, but I didn't know at the time. So I can declare that there, there was no conflict of interest because I had no idea. Um, but actually they had a very coordinated response to the community by working together and using social media and the social media outlets of the, of the civic society groups to get um, data and support out at a very grassroots level with the, with the local authority, the local health authority, um, the local private sector provider in that area and civil society. Really interesting example of an organic collaboration. The relationships were already there so they could build on them. And what's really interesting is thinking about how one can move that forward into a way of working in the future. Uh, and, and I think there's a general view that that, that that community hub has worked incredibly effectively. Something we're really interested in, so we're running a program um, called Healthy Communities Together, which we're running jointly with the King's Fund, which is precisely looking at how um, health inequalities can be reduced by facilitating better partnership across sectors. 
at the heart of everything we do is our is our strategic framework, which we call putting people in the lead. And um, this is where inclusion really runs through our entire DNA. And when I talk about inclusion, I don't just mean looking at those with protected characteristics. I'm looking at how to value a multiplicity of experience, expertise and voice and to give those actors agency in what happens and in the choices and the activities that take place in whatever their sphere of activity or influence is. It, 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 um, it's one of the biggest challenges that I think that we face, this sense, and I think you alluded to it, Ottiline, of separation and walls. Uh, and it's not just between science and people, it's, it's all over the place. We see it everywhere, it's geographic, um, it's between sectors and so on and so forth, it's between communities. Uh, and a core part of what we're trying to do is to build some of the connections and the relationships to enable some fragile healing to take place. And there are some real pioneers working here. I would cite the Centre for Knowledge Equity, um, who are committed to creating a sort of UK-wide infrastructure that celebrates, connects and elevates community expertise for social impact um, and values all forms of human wisdom in designing solutions. Um, it's a very holistic approach. It requires all of us, of course, to change the way we do things. We've run a, a programme, we're on our second stage now, called Le Funding Leaders with Lived Experience. Often people with lived experience find it hard to navigate um, traditional pathways, traditional ways of doing in organisations. What the Leaders with Lived Experience programme does, and by the way, it's been vastly oversubscribed in the two rounds that we've run so far, um, is help to develop those leadership skills, help to develop some of those small granular organisations that are working with people with lived experience and led by people with lived experience, and at the same time, change the mainstream in doing that. We've worked particularly hard at this um, um, with regard to um, particularly BAME communities during the COVID crisis. Uh, and we've been running some emergency funding for the charitable sector for government. Uh, and of that money, just about 18% has go, gone to organizations that specifically target BAME communities. And we've also developed a, a fund called the Phoenix Fund. And what's interesting about both those things is that we didn't start from a strong base. And this was only seven, eight months ago. We started from actually a pretty weak base. Um, and we recognised pretty swiftly that members of, of, of the black and minority ethnic communities didn't necessarily trust us, feel that we were for them. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a happy message to receive. But we decided that we had to act upon this and actually um, visibly and actually in our spine uh, address it. And that went from me having a meeting with representatives of 250 different infrastructure organisations from those communities through to working at all, uh, with all our regional and local staff to um, reach out and build relationships. Uh, and the Phoenix Fund is really interesting in its methodology. We're working with the Global Fund for Children uh, and it is specifically designed to address the COVID emergency in um, black and minority ethnic communities, but it has been co-designed um, and is co-governed by uh, those communities themselves. So we are sitting alongside and working with another funder, um, but actually the, um, the agency here is held by those communities. Uh, and we're really rather proud of how that's gone and we'll be looking at how it can influence and inform us moving forward. I'll just wrap up with a little bit about COVID. Um, obviously it's been a massive challenge for everybody. Um, a lot of the organisations that we support faced a, a double whammy. They had massively increased demand. Um, you all have seen it, the extraordinary growth and the need of, um, for people to have food, um, for people to have contact, um, and for people to even have things as simple as having medicines delivered to them. But at the same time, they lost a lot of their funding because they couldn't undertake any fundraising. Um, a lot of these organisations raised quite a lot of money through very traditional forms of things like sponsored runs or coffee mornings or at the slightly grander end, um, sort of um, charity concerts or whatever. All of that was wiped out. So we had to act very, very quickly. Our, our first act was just to make all our funding much more flexible. And we just said to all our grant holders, do what you need to do. Tell us about it afterwards. Um, don't let us hold you back in addressing this emergency. Um, and it has been 
really, um, really inspiring to see how civil society organisations have responded to the crisis and what they've done um, to address it and the creative ways in which they've changed what they do. Uh, it's also accelerated things. The move online has been phenomenal. I, I know it's happened to all organisations. Civil society is not at the forefront of technology. They've really galloped ahead in moving services online and there'll be a lot of learning for that moving forward. But as well as doing that, funding we were also really interested in learning about what was happening and what could be different as a result so we moved our knowledge and learning team for producing quite long reports that take quite a number of months into producing a series of kind of rapid fire responses on particular topics in particular areas and getting that out very quickly not just internally but also externally we recalibrated um, all our evaluation contracts, about 30 million quid's worth of them, um, on, on all our major programmes to make them um, pandemic responsive so that we changed the way in which they're working and, and recalibrated them. And we launched um, a fund which is specifically looking at how we can fund practical activities that give new thinkers and storytellers the chance to share the worlds and communities that they want to create and be a part of for the future. And the aim of that was to build on and also amplify the creativity and compassion that I've just been talking about that we've seen in communities and in online civil society across the pandemic. So that in doing that, we can take advantage of what we're learning and what those, um, those grant holders are learning and experimenting to build a rather different future. And I think I just finished by saying, I think I mentioned um, earlier that that sense that um, if I think about my office, or our offices, which I no longer go to, uh, are, they seem very dull and really rather old fashioned. I, I think one of the things that the pandemic is doing is showing us that there is a digital world, which isn't just about being online. It's about a way of working and a way of doing. It's about having agility and flexibility. It's about having intimate relationships as well as platforms that can operate at scale that show us an opportunity to work very differently in the future that gives us all the chance actually to be more than the sum of the parts and to feel part of a whole that actually in the rather technocratic machine bureaucracy of the sort of 20th century way of doing things actually has become rather exclusionary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn. Again, um, a second really interesting and thought-provoking presentation. So we've got lots of questions coming through in the in the Q and A, which I'll try and and, uh, and get to um, and and brigade them together where I can. Um, but I thought what was really interesting that came out of both presentations was the idea of uh, of inclusion and co-creation as being at the heart of getting research and researchers and uh, civil society to work together. Um, but I think sometimes the barrier, one of the barriers that gets in the way of that are the power imbalances, particularly between the funded and the unfunded or the, the organized and the more organically structured organizations. So I wonder if um, uh, Ottoline or Dawn, maybe Ottoline first, had any thoughts about how we can tackle those power imbalances to really enable the kind of co-creation and inclusion that you've both talked about. Um, yeah, so I, I agree. It, it's um, it, We all are very actively talking about co-creation and inclusion. We're really committed to it, but it is definitely not easy um, in all kinds of ways. Uh, it, uh, particularly since um, you know I've, the, the 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 most excluded people are more or less by definition the hardest to reach for a whole variety of reasons, and I would agree with you that some of that is imbalances in power and resource and all of those things. Um, and I don't have easy solutions. I'd be very interested in, in, in Dawn's reply to this question with, because she's much more expert in these areas than we are. And we're very keen to work precisely with organizations that are able to reach the parts that others can't reach. <laughs> she said, I am old enough to remember that advert <laughs> um, uh, because uh, we fully acknowledge that we in the university system are in a position of, of privilege and um, and 
need to be the ones who are actively reaching out to bridge those gaps because we have more um, opportunities to do that than the people whom we're trying to reach. Shall I come in now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cool. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is really very difficult and very challenging stuff because if you're serious about it, it actually means you have to be prepared to rethink some of the basics about what you think is the right way of doing things and how you organize yourselves. Well, let's say we, because this is equally applicable to, to all of us. Um, how, how we structure, how we make decisions, what we think excellence is. Uh, and we also have to be systematic about it um, because um, saying it doesn't make it happen. Um, I, I, it takes years, uh, it takes determination, uh, it takes expertise. Uh, there are experts in communities who can help do this. And maybe an interesting piece of taking this conversation forward. If I look at, so for example, what we've just learned putting up the Phoenix, setting up the Phoenix Fund, we, we have opened ourselves and been open to a whole set of new networks who will bring a richness of experience and expertise that we wouldn't have otherwise had. And we really need to build on that. We also need to be the network that can create other networks and help other folk like you who are even further away than we are. So I think that, that, that we can help each other here. Um, uh, and I do think that, uh, so for example, in our own organization, we just created two posts, one to work internally on inclusion and one to work externally on, uh, on, uh, on inclusion and diversity across all our funding. And I, I do think um, it has to be taken at a board level very seriously. I think um, you have to recognize that in order to do it, you have to change and be different. There's a great quote that I'll end with. I, it's James Baldwin, and I'm not sure whether I'll get it quite right. But it goes something along the lines of, um, in order to learn your name, you first have to learn mine. And I think that's really profound because what he's really saying there is you can't really understand yourself unless you understand me. Uh, and I think in this context, it is really about what is the impact of opening oneself up to diversity and inclusion in a way that is meaningful does mean that we are all different. Personally, as someone who is curious uh, and likes exploration, I find that very exciting. Um, but it is very challenging and, and very hard work and it needs to be sustained. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's true. It's a long-term project, I think, is a mm. really key out, outcome for this. I'm gonna try and pick up something from the Q&A now and, and try and, and weave it in a little bit to um, to what both of you have said. So, so there's a there's a bit of commentary around around your use of the word science, Ottoline, and the and the diversity of disciplinary um, experiences that might be relevant to some of the challenges we're talking about. Um, and, and I think I think that's a really interesting commentary about about the way in which you know the research world perhaps thinks about this in terms this these questions in terms of academic disciplines and is it science or social science or arts and humanities. And I was very struck by something in your presentation, John. You, you said right at the beginning that your your focus is on what matters to communities, not what not what's the matter with communities, which I think is a really uh, powerful um, powerful thing to say. And so I suppose my question is, you know, what to what extent is this focus on disciplinary structures a barrier to um, to working more broadly? And for, for Dawn, maybe what. What do what do the cult of, sort of communities you work with? How do they make sense of this uh, of this kind of this notion of academic disciplines and how that fits into their their world? Mm. Um, so I think I think that's a you know that's that's kind of comes out of all both of your your comments really. So Ottoline. Yeah, I, this is I mean this comes up a lot. Um, I, if I may, I quite like to zoom out a little bit and, and because it also addresses another question that's come up in the Q and A about the quality of, of public discourse. Um, and I, I think what we see here in terms of all of these barrier building activities that I've talked about is absolutely classic Hedgefell social identity theory. Um, it's about uh, people under pressure um, creating an in-group where everybody agrees with each other and part of the, the 
elements required to create that in-group are to create an out-group where you inherently disagree with the out-group and you, then you build up these um, uh, balkanized uh, um, communities um, whose identity is really rooted in agreeing with each other and not liking the other guys. <laughs> and um, you can see that in the divide between um, all kinds of divides in society. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in academia where arts and humanities and the social sciences have been artificially divided from, um, from STEM. And we ourselves reinforce those divisions in the way that we talk about those things. So I think um, it's very interesting the way um, those uh, uh, divisions are um, articulated as one versus the other. Um, and particularly in the context of where we're talking about um, public engagement and how we bring, take down barriers and how we stop talking about one versus the other, I think it's um, rather important that we examine our own house and stop talking about one versus the other in the context of, of, of disciplines. And, and this gets back again, you know, it does wrap into these definitions of excellence. I think we have very good evidence that excellence means diversity particularly in the context of research and innovation, a high quality research and innovation environment is all about diversity. All the interesting stuff happens with difference. So mm -hmm. creating those environments is dawn very clearly expressed where difference is welcome, where if somebody disagrees with you, you step in and say, oh, that's exciting, do tell me more, rather than feel threatened and step away and build a defensive barrier. That's key inside the research and innovation system and between the research and innovation system and wider society, which because that between we have to get rid of. So I think um, we have to recognize as researchers and innovators that we are also people and therefore we ourselves are behaving in exactly the same way as we are anxious um, about um, the, our wider stakeholder communities behaving and we have to um, simultaneously address our own um, uh, uh, abilities and desires to erect, erect barriers with our desire to take down barriers between us and, and wider society. Yeah, and that, that speaks to Dawn's comment earlier about, about learning learning someone else's name before you, you really know Absolutely. your own. And, and actually maybe part of the solution to the barriers and difficulties within the research system is, is to look more outside the research system and, and to understand what's going on outside. Dawn, what, what are your thoughts on Yeah, that? so I think I think it's a really interesting question. It goes it goes way beyond sort of research and, and you guys and it touches a, a sort of the heart of society in a way. And I, I do wonder whether part of the consequence of um, ha life having become full of specialists um, has uh, in in that sort of machine bureaucracy technocratic you, you can see I really don't like that way of doing things um, sort of frame has just in, encouraged the development of, of silos uh, rather than that much more interesting much more porous way of, of operating I think the other thing that um, I would I, I would throw into this um, because I think it's a society wide thing is we have we have collectively um, we are collectively losing the ability to have discourse uh, around complex topics with where people have divergent views. Um, and I think that's very problematic because, you know, if you look at any sort of, uh, listen, I'm no scientist, but, you know, anything around science, anything around discovery or innovation will, for example, have throw up ethical issues of some description. How brilliant to have the philosophers around the table, how brilliant to have the practitioners around the table. And that, that's a sort of academic example, but you could re replicate that. And you, and you asked me what, what the sort of communities we fund would think about the sort of discipline thing in, in universities uh, um, and in research. I, I'm not sure they'd be e even aware of it. I think that there's such a division um, that, that uh, unless someone has a, although you always find a way through because, you know, you, you meet someone that you're funding who's, you're funding them to do community gardening and then you discover they're really interested in local history uh, and actually they've been doing so, you know. So, so there are these connections. We have to find them and we have to invest in them. And, and I think because we've become rather transactional rather, rather than relational, we haven't invested enough in understanding the richness of each other and finding the common threads 
uh, we've been kind of driven by the sort of super tanker into another set of outcomes, which are which really aren't very human scale. That's my phone. I'm just going to switch it off. <laughs> So, um, yeah, okay, thank you. So, so this links in, you mentioned this, this kind of, uh, Artelie mentioned this, this in her presentation, this uh, lack of quality in public discourse. Um, when, and there's a question in the Q&A about that, about what, what, do, what do we attribute that, that to? But Dawn, I don't, from, from your perspective, you know, you, you're kind of hinting at it there that, that almost it's a disengagement with some, or, or, or a lack of engagement between um, between the research world and, and mm. communities outside. Do, do you want to expand a bit more on that? What, why, where do you think this, the quality of discourse is, is, or the lack of quality of discourse is coming from? Um, well, I think it goes back a little bit to the point I, I made about people becoming very specialist, uh, and then they talk, uh, and there's lots of languages. In every time you change organisation, you have to learn a completely different set of acronyms and language and culture, etc. Which I guess twas ever thus, but it feels a, a bit more niche than perhaps things have been. I think there's also a massive dislocation in, in, in what people, communities on the ground, often are, are, are uh, thrive actually, as communities, people look at them from the outside and think, oh, no, there's, there's dysfunctional. Whatever. Actually, they, they thrive, but they're seen um, as not having assets when actually they have an awful lot of assets. So I, I think there's a sort of structural thing. Um, I also think that the, the way in which uh, our media and social media have grown have coarsened that conversation uh, and therefore made it well, so on the one hand it is, isn't it fantastic to go on Twitter and be able to find out something that someone's done on the other side of the world that is really exciting and interesting and you can dip into it on the other hand there's an awful lot of stuff there that is really dysfunctional and unhealthy and I think that has also accentuated it um, I think people feel a long long away way from power and agency uh, and that's why I think it's so important that if you're if we want to have that greater engagement, actually, we have to give away some of the power and the agency uh, uh, and enable others to take it. And, and we will all be enriched in that process. Now, if you were to say to me, can I point to the four um, REF research reports that demonstrate that and quantify the impact? I couldn't, because in a sense, I think I'm coming from a different place. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I, I guess one of the things that comes out of this is the, is the importance of listening and the extent to which yeah. both sides of this divide yeah. are actually able to listen constructively to, to the other. And that's part of why there's a divide, I guess. Um, Ottilie, you, you brought in this, this point about the quality of public discourse around the COVID yeah. pandemic. You want to say a bit, a bit more about that? Well, I, th I, think, well, I think it, um, I, I, I absolutely agree with the things that Dawn has said. I think that's a really, uh, key element of, of the conversation. I think beyond that, um, we live in a society where, uh, which is kind of inherently adversarial in the way that it mm. um, considers disagreement. Um, and um, then that's amplified by social media, I think, in a well, well, under, you know, well understood, but nonetheless, very difficult to address way. And, and we get back to this question of um, how you create uh, environments, but also societies where difference and disagreement are, are considered a good thing mm -hmm. rather than, um, you know, the current situation where, for example, changing your mind is a U-turn um, <laughs> and a weakness, and that's terrible. And, um, <laughs> and I, I, I find that extraordinary as in the context of, of research, particularly, which is all about you know, exploring in principle multiple types of evidence and, and synthesizing them and, and, and being always open-minded and ready to change your mind. And um, I think that's, uh, that's crucial. And I, a lot of it gets back to this reframing of research as a, 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 a mechanism to navigate uncertainty. At the moment, mm -hmm. um, in the public discourse, it's kind of reached for as a, a place to find the, the answer. And um, that is incredibly unhelpful for, for all kinds of, of reasons, I think. And um, so it, 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 there are many 
I think we're in one of those kind of perfect storm situations. Insecurity and anxiety drives up the this um, kind of in-group, out-group building and, and um, inequalities then tend to amplify uh, in very unhelpful ways and create it much more difficult to have those high quality conversations at the same time as we're living in a world where anyway those conversations are being eroded by um, the way social media works and the way our, me our, our regular media work and the whole kind of quality and the kind of, the kind of approach to debate in public life and I, I think we as, uh, as a research and innovation community have a tremendously important role to play in, in reframing that debate, which is why I actually think we have to deal, we have to stop worrying about our internal divides because they are, in my view, trivial compared to this much broader question. And, and um, I, I just think that's key <laughs> to, to moving together um, in, in a more uh, constructive way. Yeah, and I think you've both, both talked in different ways about about, uh, about overly adversarial um, approaches to communication. And I think, yeah, there's a kind of irony here that I think the, the research world, in, in my view, has always had a bit of a problem with disagreeing in a civil way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and now we have a social media world that has spread the, the challenge of disagreeing in a, or the problem of disagreeing in an uncivil way we're out into society um, and, and, and actually made that the norm, which is which is part of the problem in, in these debates. Um, I'm going to stay on the digital and move to another question on the uh, on the Q&A, um, which was specifically a question for Dawn. So I'll, I'll ask Dawn to respond first. But Otherine, if you've got any thoughts on this uh, also, please do come in. Um, so the question is that, you, that Dawn, you mentioned briefly about the digital sphere bringing uh, some new opportunities for working with communities. Um, but are, is the move online going to potentially exclude some mm. populations that are already or isolated or less likely to be in, engaged? And what can we do about this? Yeah, so there's, there are definitely digitally excluded communities. Um, so I suppose when I was think, talking, when I was using digital, I was kind of using it in a slightly lazy way as a proxy for perhaps just a new way of thinking and operating. So I'm not necessarily talking about everything being online, although actually there is a lot of stuff and, and a lot of civil society has moved online. Um, and I think in, in the crisis, it's, it's, been very, it's going to be very interesting as the sort of evaluation starts to come in to see where that moving of services online has resulted in an improvement or, or at, at, at worst, no difference, and where actually it hasn't necessarily worked. So there's a sort of there was a sort of massive thing about oh we can do all our counselling online, and some people say well actually that won't work, and it will. But I think there will be some evidence that in some spheres that works very well, in others it doesn't. So so the online dis digital exclusion, yes, absolutely. Um, but I suppose I was trying to use digital as a sort of um, as a proxy for a counter to the rather large scale technocratic machine bureaucracy systems way we've had of doing things for prob probably kind of born actually out of the industrial revolution if you go far back enough um, although this is stretching my knowledge um, to a way of operating that is actually more human is more relational um, is more organic is potentially more local, but also has the, um, we have the technical potential now to almost plug and play a community from just it's very, very local into something that can exist. So it can actually relate to a community over in Australia may, may, or, 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 or in Asia or in Africa or South America. Um, I mean, maybe it's the 21st century reworking of the old um, pen pal system that used to exist, where you got to understand the world and learn from it through writing letters to people you've never met. Um, but it's, it seems to me that actually there's a whole way of working that I I see in um, folk who are generally younger than me uh, and they just have a different attitude. And, and I think that if you just think about the way offices have worked and how actually we just got to bust that open now as what a potty way of running organisations that we all had these grey desks that all looked exactly the same. We all came into them, you know, nine till five or nine till seven or whatever, whatever, um, every day. I'm not suggesting that everyone should be sitting at their kitchen table like I am forevermore, but, but actually something that is... Um, I sometimes describe it as institutions have been like houses with very, very, very high fences around them, 
and the gate's shut and the front door's shut and all the windows are closed and the curtains are drawn. If you recreate institutions where you take down the fences uh, and there's common land between them uh, and there aren't gates, and in fact you take the doors away and the windows are open uh, and people move freely between the rooms, you've suddenly got a really different way of thinking about how you operate. And that's really what I'm talking about, where, there, where it seems to me we do have an opportunity to move away from something that is quite rigid to something that is much more flexible, much more adaptive, much more human centred, because almost all of our institutions now I used to talk about it as inverting the pyramid, where institutions have a pyramid where the people are at the bottom and often actually, well, it was not really, that nobody would admit it, the sort of customers are at the bottom. Uh, and the further you go up, the more power there is. And at the top, you have the sort of, you know, the board and the chief executive. But if you inverted that, which I think you can do now, so that actually the organisation is almost irrelevant because it's constantly reframing who it works with and how it works. Um, so it's much more collaborative, much more partnership based. Anyway, that, that was what I was getting at there. Yeah. So and, and there is exclusion, not aside, there is a kind of democratizing effect yeah. of digital technologies that they allow Absolutely. people to self-organize in yeah. ways that were, that were very difficult. Otsleen, what are your thoughts on, on research engagement and, and how digital technologies might, might impact that? Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. And I, I uh, agree again with a huge amount of what Donna said it. At some level, I think the 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 kind of obligatory shift to digital engagement um, has created the opportunity to reset um, the the kind of go to mechanisms for communication in a way that I think we need to 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 capture as we move forward. Um, absolutely, create those much more porous interfaces but at the same time and certainly for me anyway it's highlighted the extraordinary benefit of of talking to people properly <laughs> and um, it's very difficult I think or, it, it, on the one hand you know this kind of zoom conference is brilliant we can reach lots of people all over the place it, on the other hand uh, as Dawn said at the beginning I find it really hard when you can't see the audience and um, and even when you can see the audience, if you're you know chairing a committee of twenty people on Zoom, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I really miss those deep conversations. But I can see a world where that blending of those things and and thinking harder and more openly about all the tools available is really key. We get stuck very easily into ruts of of um, how we work and what we do and. Uh, the massive shakeup that the pandemic has caused, I think um, if, if, we, if we reset, the reset should be into a position of, of open mindedness mm. um, and thinking continuously about how best to do things and what alternative tools there are available rather than saying, oh, instead of doing it like this, we'll do it like that. <laughs> and that's what I, I hope we will get out of that. But that is hard work. And um, that's that, you know, it's thinking fast, thinking slow in, in the um, now fairly well established um, uh, uh, paradigm. We have to find much better ways to think slow. Yeah, so we're coming clo close to the end of our time now. So I'm going to apologize for all the questions that we haven't addressed um, in the Q&A. There, there were lots of great questions there. Um, uh, um, we, I wish we had more time, um, but I'm going to ask a final question, which I'm, I'm going to ask to Dawn and then then Ottilie just to wrap up the session. And this one is is really to think, you know, we've heard about both of of your organisations and your aspirations, and there seems to be a lot of commonality there. Mm. So my my final question is, how do you think that the the Community Lottery Fund and UKRI could work together more in the future? So Dawn first, and then Ottilie, and then. Mm. So I don't know the specific answers to that question, but um, the, the first, first thing has got to be to talk to each other uh, and look at where those common areas might be. And I have a little theory that I call generous leadership, which is uh, a generous leader is someone who starts from the position of what is the common good. Uh, as opposed to how do I protect my organisation? So boards won't like this at all. Uh, but anyway, um, so what is the common good? Has a very fine understanding of the ecology in which they operate and an equally fine understanding of what is the added value that I and my organisation or whatever um, the entity is bring 
and has the capacity to work in that ecology in a collaborative way to the common good, whatever those shared objectives may be. And it seems to me that actually, if, if we were to think about um, the National Lottery F Community Fund and UKRI in terms of exploring that notion, where, where, is, the, where is the common good that um, we could collectively achieve more if we work together, that, that would be where we'd start. Now, I, I think to work effectively, organisations have to get to know each other. And I think that takes time and, you and come back to it. You have to build relationships. You have to invest time in those relationships. So I, I would say I don't know what the specifics are, but I think the, the, the beginning is a conversation, uh, which is very exciting, actually. Yeah, <laughs> completely agree. It's great. <laughs> Looking forward to building those relationships. And um, and um, yeah, I, I so one of the things that I've tried to do coming into UKRI is, is, is shift the narrative about what UKRI does away from um, a, a lot of that, you know, be the best leadership language into a, a more stewardship. What do, you know, what does this what, what does what do we want from the system and how can we try to influence um, uh, and convene and catalyze and bring together the right people um, to build that system that, that works for everybody. And our entire framing, um, it tends to be very much this versus that. Um, and that's embedded partly in, 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 as we've talked about already, narrow definitions of, of excellence that focus on only one part of the, the whole system. And we need the entire system to be working well um, to, to deliver genuine excellence. And that means supporting diversity so we, you know all of these things go 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 around in a in a circle and I think that is as Dawn says key we've got to we've got to think about um zoom out ask what we're really trying to achieve collectively and then um where we individually um can use any agency that we have to try to support that and it's about that sense of collective responsibility for a shared vision and mm -hmm. and, and uh, creating the time, prioritizing the time to, to build that, I think is really important. Thank you, Oswin. That's a brilliant place to end. I think you'll agree that this has been a fantastic discussion. Apologies again for not getting to all the questions and thank you for the questions uh, to everyone who put them in. Uh, but most of all, thank you to our fantastic panelists, Dawn Astrick and Oswin Lyser.